Ah, it's nice to be able to breathe. Anybody else have that trouble? All right, well, um, Albert finished up um, First Peter on chapter 5 uh, two weeks ago. And today we'll be starting on Second Peter. And it's chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. If you want a title for it, you could call it Confirm Your Calling. And it commences, Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which we have been given or has been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control or self-discipline, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. In my view, the author of 2 Peter is undoubtedly Peter. Some theologians, usually of a liberal persuasion, try to set the date somewhere in the late 2nd or early 3rd century, and the author, some unknown person using Peter's name. But the internal evidence in the letter itself suggests otherwise. Firstly, it links very well with 1 Peter, and there's no dispute that Peter was the author of that letter. There are common words. Precious, for example, appears in both. Some of the phrases reflect, reflect the language of fishing. One of the words he uses is entice or enticing, which I'm told in the Greek means to catch with a lure, which is fishing. A problem for Bible interpreters is that the Greek style in both writing and language is very fluent in the first letter and not so in the second, and that has prompted doubts about the authorship. But those doubts are removed when you realise that it was common in those days for the author of a letter to employ, they call them an amanusis, or secretary who did the actual writing. And in a sense, you could relate it to the CEO of a company today who says to his personal assistant, I want you to write a letter to so-and-so and tell him this, this, and this. Put it in a form and I'll sign it. Now, that's not exactly how it happened, but the first letter 
we're told was written by Silvanus, who's better known to us as Silas, a companion of Paul, who was well educated in classical Greek. Peter wasn't. He wrote in Koine Greek, the common Greek. So there's a difference. One is very fluent and flows nicely. The second one is a little bit awkward in places. Either way, the content is Peter. As far as a historical setting is concerned, First Peter was probably written around about 64 AD. Second Peter, about 67 AD. The general message of 1 Peter is get ready, and in 2 Peter it's hang in there. 2 Peter may well have been written while Peter was awaiting execution. As I'm told, I'm not a Greek scholar, but as I'm told by the Greek scholars, in the Greek, Peter refers to Paul in the past tense. So it may have been shortly after the execution of Paul. Formal persecution by Nero was swift and bloody, but it was local. It was confined to Rome. It had not commenced when 1 Peter was written, but was well underway when 2 Peter was written. Later persecution under the Flavian emperors, that's Vespasian, Titus and Domitian, particularly Domitian, saw Christianity declared to be an outlawed religion. Domitian was the emperor who uh, had John sent into exile to the Isle of Patmos. The empire was wide. And they didn't mind how many gods they were, but they had to be state-sanctioned gods, one of whom was the emperor. And there was one day in the year when everyone in the Roman Empire was to bow before a statue of Caesar, light incense, etc., and declare Caesar is Lord. Now, no Christian can do that. Some used to get by it by standing in front of the statue, bending down and tying their, their sandals or something like that. Others just flatly refused to do it and suffered the consequences. In Revelation, it says that, John says rather, uh, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Now, in our modern thinking, we think the Lord's Day is the first day of the week. They didn't call it that. The Lord's Day was the day on which you bowed before Caesar. It was better known as the Lordly Day. So I can well imagine why John would be in the spirit on the Lordly Day. There's no way he was going to acknowledge Caesar. And he was encouraging other Christians not to acknowledge anyone other than the one and only true God. So the fabric of society was pagan and religion was something that you just did. It really didn't have any significance, but it did to Christians. You see, by refusing to bow to Caesar, Christians became traitors and were therefore subject to death. And it was during the reign of Domitian, as I said, that the letters of John and Revelation were written. So the good news of Christianity was bad news for all the old gods. The themes in 2 Peter are not set out in a logical fashion. But summarised, you could say that firstly, it's faith under pressure. Focus on the eternal, not the temporal. Emphasis on the sovereignty of God and the cultivation of Christian character, which is what chapter one is about. Throughout the message, there is hope. The cross and the resurrection of Jesus gives hope of the resurrection of believers. Then in chapter 2, 
It's beware false teachers. And in chapter 3, the last days, summed up, Jesus wins. Confidence in Christ's return. It's a letter to warn, encourage and instruct the church to meet the challenges that will be thrust upon them. Well, let's have a look now at chapter 1. He commences the letter, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, Simon in Hebrew means a reed. And a reed is something that's weak and easily swayed by whatever wind there is. So his name suggests that his character was a little bit go with the flow sort of thing. But he also uses the name Peter. And in Greek, that name means a rock. A bond servant was one who was bound to the master and could never be freed. You can read about that in Exodus 21 verses 1 to 6, where a Hebrew slave, if he loved his master, could opt to stay his slave forever or until death. He was then pierced through the ear by putting his ear up to a doorpost and they punched a hole in it with an awl. That branded him for life and if he ran away, he was liable to the death penalty. So a bond slave is someone who's bound to his master by love for his master. An apostle means a sent one. One sent with a message and in those days it was virtually synonymous with ambassador. One who spoke a message on behalf of the king. Now was Peter always like that? And of course the answer is no, he wasn't. A quick look at one verse in John, Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 42. Andrew brings Peter to Jesus. That says, and he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a rock. So here we see where Jesus looked at Peter with his natural sight. The same as I'm looking at you people and you're looking at me. It's natural sight. With insight, he could see that Peter lived up to his name, Simon. That he was...
by adding his promises. We have escaped the corruption of the world. That's the minus. We're minus the corruption of the world. And we are divided from it. There's division between the divine nature imparted to us and the corrupt nature of the world. And I think that's a very healthy lesson in mathematics. Our faith is equal. Grace and peace are multiplied to us. God's power has added to us everything we need for godliness and life by adding his promises. We're minus the corruption of the world because we are divided from it. The division between the divine nature imparted to us and the corrupt world. Well, what about verses 3 and 4? Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious promises and magnificent promises in order that by them you might become partakers of the divine nature, etc. So what's that provision for holiness that he's talking about? Well, firstly, there's power. His divine power is available to each of us who submits to his lordship. Then there is provision granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness, power and provision. Then there's person. It is the true intimate knowledge of him that makes it possible. This is just knowledge about, but a personal relationship with. You know the Lord Jesus Christ intimately. The same as a husband and wife know each other intimately. You know each other. And that's what it means when it says you need to know the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a personal relationship. You could read the Bible and know all about him. I mean, I could have read June's life history and say, yes, I know all about June, but I didn't know June. Now I could say that I know her and unfortunately she knows me. Then we have God's promises. Precious and magnificent. And the purpose of the power, provision, intimate knowledge of the person and the promises is the purpose that we might develop godliness. And in developing that godliness, we then have participation. We become partakers of the divine nature, which some people think only happens when we go to be with the Lord or he comes for us. It can happen now. That's what the scripture says. We become partakers of the divine nature. Perhaps not in the perfection it will be, but yes, we can become partakers of the divine nature and that leads to emancipation, escape from the corruption of the world. Peter then outlines this by applying seven steps to Christian maturity that will make us complete in the Lord Jesus Christ, a state in which we will avoid character defects or minimise character defects. And we will be neither useless nor unfruitful, neither will we stumble. The result... Oh, we'll have a glorious entrance into the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, these seven steps are progressive. You can, if you like, think of it like a ladder. And I know some of us are at an age where we shouldn't be climbing ladders, but this is one ladder that you can climb. The bottom rung is faith. That's the basis of it. Faith. 
And the next step after faith is knowledge. And as I said before, it's not just knowing about God, it is facts fully known and applied to life. Or virtue, sorry, is the next one. Faith and then virtue. It rests in faith. And then in faith and virtue rests knowledge. That leads to self-control, all based in faith. Self-control or self-discipline. That brings about perseverance or endurance. Hang in there, no matter what happens. Always keep your eyes on Jesus. Whatever's happening around the place, keep your eyes on Jesus. Hang in there. That leads to godliness, where people know that you're different. You're different in the way you talk. You, you, they feel that difference when you're with them because there is a godliness about that person. Then you have brotherly kindness. Now, this is not just kindness to fellow Christians. It goes beyond that to kindness to everybody. Even those who despitefully use you, pray for them. Do something good for them. And in doing so, it tells us in Proverbs and somewhere else, I think it's in Hebrews, you heap coals of fire upon their head. I like that. <laughs> but that heaping coals of fire is in fact talking about causing them shame for the way that they've treated you because you've treated them the exact opposite. And I think that's what Jesus talks about when he says, turn the other cheek. Doesn't mean if they slap you on one cheek, turn the other, slap you on that cheek, right? Oh, you've done that. Your problem now. No, it, having forbearance. Do something good to those who do something nasty to you. And it makes them ashamed. And other people will see that you're different. And then out of all that comes love. The agape, all-encompassing love. But you notice that with each step, it is in the previous. They are intended to be progressive. Christian character is something that's developed. It doesn't just happen. There's some effort involved, but the Holy Spirit gives us the power to be able to do it. Still looking at 2 Peter in that passage, you could come up with another summary of Christian growth, starting from the point of conversion. This is a list of C's. Firstly, there is conviction that we are sinners and need a saviour. And that's part of the problem. Well, it is the problem why Israel did not accept Jesus as Messiah. He wasn't the Messiah they expected. They didn't believe that they needed to be saved from the slavery of sin because they were the children of Abraham. And people today do not believe that they need to be saved from the slavery of sin because they're not sinners. They're good people. They do good. You know, it's like the old used car salesman. I'm nice, my wife's nice, my dog's nice, I'll sell you a nice car. You know, <clears throat> they think by being good that they're going to make it to heaven. God wouldn't turn me away, I'm a good person. Did any of you happen to watch Q&A last Thursday night on the ABC? Martin Isles, the, uh, what is he, CEO, I think, of the Australian Christian Lobby. He was on there and there was some politician there who proudly stated that he was gay and all the rest of it. 
And somewhere along the line, Martin mentioned, you know, John the Baptist's first words were repent. Jesus' first words were repent. And this politician comes out, well, what have I got to repent of? No understanding that we are all born sinners and we need to be saved from the slavery of sin. And the only way to do that is through Jesus Christ because he is the way, the truth, the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. Now, that's very exclusive. Except that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And God so loved the world, he sent his only son, that whosoever believed in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. We hear that one a lot. What about 3.18? Follows on. There's no full stop. It follows on. He that believeth is not condemned, because he has believed in the name of the only Son of God. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he does not believe. Now, you can't get much plainer than that. But you see, firstly, they have to accept that there is a God to whom we're accountable. And with all the evolution stuff around the place, uh, a lot of people don't even realize there's a God. They, they, they're so immersed in all this evolution. And I think it takes a lot more faith to believe in evolution than what it does to believe in the creator God. That's far more rational, far more sensible, and far more believable. So the first step, conviction, that we're sinners and need a saviour. Then there's confession of sin and repentance. And then there's commitment of one's life to the Lord Jesus Christ and his way. And then continuance in the ways of the Lord. Then there is communion with the Lord in prayer and with other believers by gathering together to build each other up. And then there is consecration, set apart for the Lord from the world. Now you've got conviction, confession, commitment, continuance, communion, and consecration. Our security and our stability in testing times depends upon our knowledge of and security in the Lord's nature and plan. The more we know him, not know about him, the more we know him, the more stable we become. It's a practical faith based in knowledge which works out in life. As I said before, there's a difference between knowing about something or someone and truly knowing so that the life is changed. In effect, it is to grow or die. You know, you accept the Lord Jesus Christ, you confess that you're a sinner, you ask for his uh, forgiveness and you repent of your sin and your life has changed. It's sort of like getting married. Some years ago, I said two words, I do, and my life changed forever. You know, it's, it's like a marriage with a bride of Christ. He is the husband of the church. He's the bridegroom and he's coming back for his bride. We need to know the bridegroom intimately. Peter then encourages his readers by reminding them of the things they already know. And sometimes constant repetition is necessary not only of the words, but also of the behaviours. Their faith is not based in fables or fairy tales. It's based in fact. Peter was an eyewitness to Christ's glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. 
what he and James and John saw will be seen by the whole world when Jesus returns. And all believers will be witnesses to Christ's majestic glory. Peter reminds us, his readers, that the word of God is not the word of man. It came to us as the Holy Spirit inspired men of God. So it is the words of God. And the word of God is not human interpretation. It's not human impulse. It is divine inspiration. And just as God's power is the source of holiness, so the knowledge of him is the channel. In John chapter 17, verse 3, part of Jesus' high priestly prayer, we read there that to know him is eternal life. To know him is eternal life. And progress in knowing him is progress in holiness. The better we get to know him, the more we become like him. Think of some of the promises that relate to the life of holiness. In Romans 6.14, we're told we have freedom from sin's dominion. In 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9, we're told that grace is sufficient. And Peter tells us that grace and peace are multiplied to us. Philippians 4.19, we have the power to obey his commands. And Peter confirms that. We have victory over the devil, according to James 4.7. And quite often I hear people say, oh, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. No, no, no. It starts off, submit to God. Submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. He's not fleeing from you as a person. He's fleeing from the one that stands with you, behind you and in you. He flees. One Corinthians ten thirteen says we can escape from temptation. Whenever temptation comes, the Lord always makes a way of escape. We just have to look for that way of escape. It's better if you don't place yourself in a position of temptation first. But when temptation comes unexpectedly, there is always a way to escape that temptation. We have forgiveness when we confess our sins. That's 1 John 1, 9. And do you know that God has a faulty memory? He forgets our sins. He doesn't remember them anymore. Jeremiah 31, 34 says that. He remembers your sins no more. Who remembers the sins that we've committed in the past? We do. Who wants us to remember those? Satan and his minions. But the Lord says, I've forgotten them. In Psalm 103, it says, as far as the east is from the west, as far as the heavens are from the earth, so far have I removed your sins from you. And in one of the prophets, and I can't remember which one at the moment, it says they're cast into the depth of the sea. So if God forgets them, we should too. Paul knew what he'd done. He was the, what did he call himself, the greatest of all sinners. He knew that, but he also knew that he was forgiven. And that's what he preached, forgiveness. He walked as a free man to be able to speak the word of God in holiness and truth because he knew that his sins were forgiven. And uh, Psalm 50 verse 15 says, 
that when we call on the Lord, there is always a response. He always answers when you call on the Lord. Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes it's wait. Sometimes he answers positively straight off. And usually when it's wait, it means he has two or three other things in mind and you wait until all the ducks are lined up and then it all falls into place and you wonder how. No wonder Peter calls the promises fresh, precious and very great. Draw on those promises. Stand on them in faith. Believe what the word of God says and don't rely on natural intellect. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the truth of your word. And Lord, when we read your word and then apply it in our life, with your help, we can become more like you. I thank you for that promise, Lord. That you know us, you know us on the inside, you know what our potential is. And Lord, under your oversight, that we too might become rocks in the faith. In Jesus' name, amen.